I was first given the opportunity to come to this camp, I was really excited because I've always been a firm believer in Martin, Martin Luther King Jr.'s teachings. And I've, I've always thought that no one should be judged by the color of their skin. And so when I heard about this camp, I, I jumped on it because I was super excited that they had something like this. I hope to take away um, non-violence because I see now that violence is not the way to, to get through life. And principle number one, you courage. It takes courage because all of you felt as if her response should have been something else. That she should have struck back. If I come back, you need to stop calling me fat because I don't like that. But I like to eat, you know. I mean, you're not fat, you know. You you skinny. You the skinniest thing I've ever seen. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. So we good? Yeah, we good. We're yeah. Good. Uh, not only Dr. King and, and, Martin and Rosa Parks, a lot of the people, thousands of people suffered, were hung, killed, castrated. So your freedom did not come without a cost. I just encourage each and every one of you to find your greatness. Future video game developer in the making way. It was cool because it was different and it's something we can take with us for the rest of our lives. So that we can put on like a resume to say, hey, I, I coded a game. Inside of VR, a world which is called V classrooms. Remember V classrooms, virtual classrooms. Inside the classroom, you'll be able to go in with your goggles, and you'll be able to go into different rooms, and you'll be able to see and to learn and to be educated with videos that are in this classroom. Real interesting kind of way of doing it because you don't need your teachers because the best two trainers are going to be inside of these goggles. Those choices that you make will be incredible. My thing is, technology is a great area of opportunity. We got a battery. Oh, oh, oh. Right? So fully 3D printed. And then you notice that in this case, the same parts are here, right? We got a motor. We got a battery, our board, just different design, right? Kind of record at a certain level. You do whatever you want. That's the whole point. We took a 3D printer, we print what we wanted, we run apps to control it. They have the same command set, forward, back, left, and right. They look totally different. What does that tell you? That means that like, it's your decision. This here is our climate sensor, and it measures a range of different things. For the purposes of this demonstration, it's measuring ambient light. And so if you take the light and turn it on and shine it, you'll see the reading um, go oh, it's up. Going up. And you'll also see the variation on the chart. But what I want to do is make the connection to urban gardens, smart cities, back to social sustainability and environmental justice. And how does all this tie into 
the beloved community. If you're living in an area where you're dealing with environmental impacts and you can't eat healthy and you don't have access to fresh produce, then that's going to further exacerbate any health issues that you may be having. This is a map of Atlanta and this, everywhere you see in purple, those areas are food deserts where they're not, oh, they're over a mile away from a supermarket. And you can see that's a lot of area in Atlanta. Welcome to Lakewood. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so in this neighborhood, I have a very different name than Alicia Alexander. The kids and the families in this neighborhood know me as the Death Lady. And Project Karma works with kids who have had loved ones to die and who may be at risk for gang involvement. So, when you guys go out with us to do some urban gar gardening, you will also be a part of the vision that this church and this community has for their young people, which is that they would positively engage and take a look at some of the issues that Lauren brought up around environmental justice. How do you feel? Good. 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 Feel like we accomplished something great? But well, we just want to do what we call a reflection piece. Normally when you do a service project, it is great to huddle up and so the people just leaving so that we can actually think about what was accomplished today and we can really talk about, just briefly, less than five minutes, what this project means to the community. So uh, we just want to take a moment to do that. Uh, so tell me, based on Mr. Colion's presentation, What's happening in this community that requires it needing a food, a, a garden? What is it called? Food desert. Food desert. So today, you have the community that has a what? Food desert. Do what? What did you do? Took out the weed? Then did what? Clean the garden. Clean the garden? Took out the weed? What you do after you took out the weed? Planting. Planting. And if people can come here for food, how would that help? Let's think about it for a moment. Family's gonna go hungry. Family's gonna go hungry. And what kind of food would they be able to get once they're Healthy food. Healthy food. Why is that important? Why is healthy food important? So you could go back to your communities and start to say, hey, we could, where can we build a garden like this? Where can we make this happen? Because this community is a food desert. Do you think there are other food deserts that he show you in the graph? Yeah. They're all over Metro Atlanta. So the last thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about a quote from Dr. King. I'm sure you've heard it before. He says, everybody can be great because everybody can what? Serve. So today, we exhibited some greatness because we came out on a Sunday afternoon and instead of being in the recliner like I normally am on a Sunday afternoon watching some sport, we're out here helping community. That's important, right? Yes. So I want you all to say that with me. Everybody can be great. Everybody can be great. Because everybody can serve. Let's opportunity to further my knowledge of the civil rights movement and what my African American leaders have done. I really, I really like learning about these kinds of things and I've always been passionate about don't you be judged by the color of their skin or what they look like and I've, and I've, I've never had the opportunity to come to a camp like this and it's been awesome and I'm really excited. window right there, that's where the bomb went off. On the side, the man bending down the white shirt, you can't see him now, but the bomb was placed by that window and it pushed all that brick on top of the four young black girls on, on that youth Sunday and they were killed.
I'll tell you about the I'll tell you about the man that did it and how they caught him, but that's where the bomb went off in the church. I love this exhibit. It's like going back into time where this all happened. I just love it. It was amazing. Um, we are going to start by making iron tiles. Okay? Snow's furnace is a very, very important place because of the iron that we produce. And you're going to have the opportunity to create your own art today. So, what you're going to be making is this tile, okay? Now, you don't have to have this exact design. You can do your own design of your choosing. It's like, you learn so much. And it wasn't just one central location, it was all throughout the town. And they hit, they hit the strongholds. And once you hit the strongholds, you can conquer the city. This is, this is where the bomb landed on this house on January 30th, 1956. Now, you probably don't know what you studied or whatever, but you know who was in this house. Mrs. King, her best friend Mary Lucy Williams, and little baby Yoki was only 10 weeks old. Now, Dr. King was over at Ralph Abernathy's church, Reverend Abernathy's church, taking up a collection. Everybody started to whisper except for Dr. King. So now you know when everybody's whispering except for you, they're probably talking to you about you. So he sensed that. And so he asked someone, uh, what's the matter? Of course, they told him his house has been bombed. Okay, and then of course, the next thing he wants to know is how is my family? And they tell him, we don't know, we're checking on that now. He said he didn't take a full breath from the time he left that church and got here and found out that his family was not hurt. But in the meantime, three to 500 angry black people out here with every conceivable weapon. And Dr. King checked on his family. Mrs. King wasn't as upset as what I read. Wasn't as upset as he thought she would be. So he came back to the edge of the porch. She was blue, part of that glue, like family again. We all know that. And so he came back to the edge of the porch, 27 years old. Most people could have done this. Probably nobody else. All he did was raise his hand. If you knew anything, uh, if all of you know anything about the Bible, it was pretty much like peace be still. And he told his people to go home. 
He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. We have to love our white brothers and sisters, even though they're not loving us back. Go home, and that's exactly what those people did. So before I take the people in this house, I tell them, welcome to where the kings live, love, and sacrifice to make the world a better place for everybody. I try to tell people stories that speak to Dr. King's character. Uh, I know you're probably going to meet Reverend Grass if you haven't met him. Reverend Grass told me a story that speaks to Dr. King's character. And I think the qualification I like the most in his personality, he was no respect of persons. Everybody was somebody to him. So Reverend Grass is up here meeting with Dr. King and others. Somebody come to the door, Mrs. King answers the phone. So who's out, who's out there, beggar? Dr. King didn't tell that man, go away, come back later. This is what Reverend Gratz told me now. Uh, didn't tell him, come back later. He let him come in and let him speak. Reverend Gratz said the man left him with a pocket full of money because he was very convincing. And I say that is the qualification I like the most in Dr. King's personality. Just like God, he was no respect of persons. Came in his kitchen, warmed up a cup of coffee, poured that cup of coffee, and sat at the table. But I want you to listen to what he said. Fears were creeping up on his soul, not his body, not his, his mind, but his soul, his very essence. He said, Mama couldn't help me, Daddy couldn't help me, nobody could help me. He said, I had to go to the God that could make a way out of nowhere, the same one my mom and daddy taught me about. So he comes in this kitchen with these fears creeping up on his soul, pours that cup of coffee and sits down, starts to pray out loud, and I'll tell you, in my opinion, he came in here just like Jesus went in the Garden of Gethsemane to ask his father to take this cup from him. People try to deify Martin Luther King. He was no deity. Might have been a prophet, but he wasn't a deity. He was trying to figure out how to save his family, okay? I will apply these, these teachings that I've gotten from this camp in my everyday life by showing them to other people and expressing them through my words and my actions and letting other people know about this camp so they have the opportunity to come and learn about Martin Luther King.